Good morning. I'm Reverend Peter Preble, the Interim Senior Minister here at Second Congregational Church in Beverly, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to our weekly virtual worship service, and we are glad that you are with us. If you're interested in following along with the service, the worship bulletin can be found at the link that is down below this video. If you scroll down a little bit into the comment section, you'll find a link to the uh, worship bulletin, as well as the hymn sheet uh, for this week, which all can be found there. And just click on that link and you'll be able to follow along. We will continue our uh, Tuesday morning and Thursday afternoon chats via Zoom, as well as the coffee hour that follows the service for fellowship time. If you'd like to be involved in those, as I mentioned every week, just notify the church office. We'll make sure you are on the email list to get the email when those meetings happen. Partway through the service, we do uh, prayer requests. If you have any prayer requests, you can email them to me at the email address that I'll put right down here uh, below the video. It should be a little lower. It'll be like right down there somewhere. Uh, or you can put them over in the, uh, in the chat box on the YouTube uh, video or in the comment section on Facebook. We'd like to keep in touch with you during the week so you can find us on Facebook and you can like our page and get more information about what's going on there as well. Also, as a reminder, uh, you know, uh, we are still operating and we still have expenses. So just a reminder, if you are a pledger uh, to the congregation or you'd like to make a donation in support of what we're doing, you can find more information about that on the website. And I'll put a link to the website down below in the, com in the uh, more information section right near the bulletin. So again, welcome to worship with us this morning. We're glad you're here. And we'll begin our worship as we usually do with the call to worship as printed in the bulletin. People of God, let us gather to worship and praise God's name. I give thanks to you, O God, with my whole heart. I will glorify your name forever. For great is your steadfast love for me. You have delivered my soul from the depths. God says, know that I am with you and will keep you wherever you go. Now let us join together in our opening prayer as printed in the bulletin. Sower of the field, continue to be gracious with us that we may ripen into the children of God's realm and live with you forever, shining like the sun in God's heavenly home. Amen. And let us pray together in the words that our Savior taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you. 
Our scripture lesson this morning comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 13, verses 24 through 30, and verses 36 through 43. Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. When the wheat sprouted and formed heads, then the weeds also appeared. The owner's servants came to him and said, Sir, don't you sow good seed in your field? Where then did the weeds come from? An enemy did this, he replied. The servants asked him, Do you want us to go and pull them up? No, he answered, because while you are pulling the weeds, you may uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. At that time, I will tell the harvesters, first collect the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burned. Then gather the wheat and bring them into my barn. Then he left the crowd and went into the house. His disciples came to him and said, Explain to us the parable of the weeds in the field. He answered, The one who sowed the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. And the good seed stands for the people of the kingdom. The weeds are the people of the evil one. And the enemy who sows them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the harvesters are angels. As the weeds are pulled up and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will weed out of his kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. They will throw them into the blazing furnace, where they will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of the Father. Who has ears, let him hear. And here ends today's readings. Let us pray. Harvesting God, as we listen to your word, by your Holy Spirit, lead our hearts in the way of everlasting life. Amen. So we've come now this week to the final declaration in the Statement of Faith at the, of the United Church of Christ that we've been working our way through uh, these last few weeks. We have a few more uh, things to talk about as far as the statement is concerned, but for right now we've reached the end. So I want to reiterate that the statement of faith, it's not a creed. One does not have to believe any of the statement of faith to belong to the United Church of Christ. It's simply a list of beliefs and things that we say as a church, this is where we are, this is what we believe. But at the end, we come not to another belief statement such as we've had before all of this, but we come to a list of promises, the promises that God makes to all of us. Now, if you spent any time uh, reading scripture, you may or may not have a clear understanding that God is faithful even when we're not. This is the beauty, one of the beautiest things about God is that God is faithful even when we're not. Time and time again, we are provided with examples of the faithfulness of God and the covenant that God has made with his people in this area of faithfulness. Now, before we get to the promises, we need to say a little bit about what God doesn't promise, because I feel that there's some confusion here. Maybe there is, maybe there isn't. I think there's a little bit of confusion about all of this. So here's just a couple of things. God does not promise us freedom from, freedom from suffering, in fact, God took suffering upon himself in the person of Jesus Christ. God does not promise us victory over our enemies. Again, we all know this by the story of Jesus' suffering and death on the cross and by our own experience in the world. God does not promise success to the virtuous. There's no mention of prosperity in the gospel. I know that this is a big thing now that, well, not just now, but it has been for a number of years, that if you do this, 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 and this, God will bless you with an abundance of cash. Well, this may come as a surprise to some of you, hopefully not, but God is not your ATM. It's not how it works. It doesn't work that way. There was never a promise of that. God does not promise immunity from disease. But God does provide us with brains and understanding of science and our ability to listen to those people who understand these things and the use of modern technology so that humanity can in fact cure these things. So wear a mask, wash your hands, and stay home when you can. 
God does not even promise that humanity will not destroy the world we live in with weapons of our own invention. Right? God doesn't even protect us from ourselves. So there are those who like to place the blame on God for things, and then there are those who like to place the blame on others. Now, not long after some natural disaster happens, be it hurricane, fire, flood, tornado, whatever it might be, usually some preacher, usually one of the TV guys, will make headlines by blaming gay people, Democrats, liberals, or the unfaithful for the storm that's just ravaged a certain area. And when pressed about this and said, well, what about the churches and the, the, the good people? Their response always is, well, that's just collateral damage. That's just collateral damage. When the pandemic began, there were those blaming others for it, all the while downplaying its severity and saying it was no worse than the seasonal flu. God does not do any of this. God does not send storms and disease to kill off people that God doesn't like. Now, I'm not sure what God these people are making reference to, but it's certainly not the God that sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die for us. There's a certain group of folks that have the belief that we should be in constant fear of God and that we're not worthy of the love that God has for us. And there are others who are certainly not worthy. If I'm not worthy, then there's certainly a whole nother group of people that can't be worthy. And so we have to prevent them from coming to church and we have to make fun of them and pass laws against their behavior. But sure, we're not worthy. None of us are really worthy on our own merits. We're not worthy. But that doesn't mean that God loves us any less than God does. Now, in the parable that we just heard from the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus uses the example of a person sowing seeds in the garden, and then someone comes along and sows weed seeds alongside of this to spoil the work that's been done. Now, I know he, uses, he gives an explanation, but I like to use this in a little bit of a different context. So there are those who come along and sow the seeds of love, hope, grace, mercy, and all the rest. But then there's people who come along right behind those people and sow seeds of doubt and mistrust and make you think that God doesn't love you or God doesn't care for you. Now, our job in all of this is to discern the truth. We have to figure out what the truth is in all of these things. And the truth is, as far as I've discerned anyways, and as far as I'm concerned, is that God loves us all, no matter what. And I hope that you understand that and that you believe it because it really is the truth. But back to what God promises. So in the final declaration, in the final passages of the statement of faith, we read that God makes four promises to all who trust. Now I wanna note that here the word trust is used rather than the word belief. And there is a difference. We're trusting in God. We don't necessarily believe, right? We trust in a supreme being. But belief is kind of left up to us individually. So first of all, God promises forgiveness and grace. Now, we've talked about forgiveness. In fact, we talked a little bit about forgiveness last week in the fellowship time. Uh, afterwards, we talked a little bit about it in the presentation I gave on uh, developing a, a habit of scripture reading at, at Tuesday's uh, virtual uh, coffee time. So we've talked about forgiveness, but we need to talk about forgiveness more. We need to talk about forgiveness constantly because forgiveness is a very important part of our Christian experience. But the important thing to remember in all of this is that God forgives, period. God forgives. That's what we need to remember. Forgiveness is central to the gospel message, central to our belief and our beliefs in Christianity, just as love is. You've heard me talk about love a lot. I believe love is central to the gospel message, just as forgiveness is. Love and forgiveness go hand in hand. They need to be part and parcel of each other. In the Lord's Prayer, the prayer that Jesus taught us, by the way, we pray, we pray, forgive us our sins, our debts, our trespasses, whatever words we want to use, as we forgive those who sin or are in debt or trespass against us. So we are forgiven by God, and because of that, we need to forgive those who do things against us. 
Part of the very sin that we all need to be forgiven by God is our inability to forgive others. Our inability to forgive others. And I know there's a lot of reasons. I'm, I'm painting with a broad brush here and I understand that. And I know there's some situations that maybe you'll never be able to forgive the person for. And maybe we should talk about those, those things. Our salvation comes from the amazing grace of God. And I'm going to quote from Roger Shin again from his book that we've been using uh, these past weeks. This is what he says. Grace as forgiveness is the amazing grace. In the language of the statement, it gives us, this, it saves us, sorry, let's start again. In the language of the statement, it saves us from aimlessness and sin. We've heard that back a few weeks ago. It does not relieve us of responsibility. Our sins are costly to those we have harmed, to ourselves and to God. But in the assurance of forgiveness, we find ourselves more ready to forgive others. In the healing of forgiveness, we are better able to live in thanksgiving, better able to be God's servants in the service of others. So all of this is getting our mind and our hearts right. I mentioned last week the bit about communion and how the ancients believed that if you came to church for communion and you held something against your brother or sister, you were to leave your offering at the altar and go and make amends with those people and then come back and receive communion. We have to be in this right frame of mind and this is where forgiveness comes in. But knowing, first of all, we are forgiven. The second thing, or the second promise is that there will be courage in the struggle. Now this is, the struggle is specific because the statement says it's the struggle for justice and peace. The struggle goes together with love because by loving our neighbor, we must fight for them for justice and for peace. At this very moment, we're being divided. We're being divided along many lines, but we're being divided along the lines of racism. It seems that we're all being forced to choose which life matters. Several times I've heard people say that I'm tired of all the protests and riots and all the changes of names, statues coming down and all that other stuff. Well, if you're tired, I want you to imagine just for a moment how tired black people are and their struggle for equality that hasn't been going on for weeks or months or years, but for 400 years. 400 plus years. Now some of us try to explain it all away by talking about the so-called Irish slave trade, which has been debunked throughout history by historians. We try and justify it with phrases like, well, they sold their own people into slavery, which may be true, but that doesn't make it right. And it should not change our response to the whole thing. As Christians, we're called to fight for justice for all people and to strive to bring peace to the world. One of my uh, favorite scripture passages, and I have many, but one of my favorites uh, comes from uh, the sixth chapter of the prophet Micah and the eighth verse. He has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. What does the Lord require of you? to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. But we will not always be applauded for our work, but the promise of God is that God will always be there with us in the struggle if we're struggling for justice, mercy, and peace. If we're struggling against these things, I'm not so sure God is with us because it's not God's work. But if we're struggling for justice, mercy, and peace, God will be there with us. The third point, or the third promise, God's presence. Now this goes along with the previous point that God is always with us. Now I've mentioned to you before that I'm involved in disaster recovery work with the Red Cross and also with the UCC. Very often after some tragic event has happened and, and I'm sitting with people and we're having a discussion, I'm asked, why God would let this happen or where God was when all of this was happening. Now, we don't always want to hear the answer. We're not always in the right frame of mind. We're not always in the right place to hear the answer to those questions. But the answer is, and I've said this before, 
God does not cause these things to happen. God does not cause the hurricane, tornado, or disease, regardless of what Pat Robertson or any of the other fear-mongering preachers want you to believe. And where's God? Right alongside of us, going through it with us. Now, it's not always easy to feel the presence of God or to even understand that God is present. Now, we might understand it on an intellectual level. We might understand it here in our brain, but in our heart, maybe not so much. The ancients believed that the longest distance was between our mind and our hearts. That we might believe something. Belief takes place here. Faith takes place here. So it's not always possible. We're not always in that right frame of mind. But that does not mean that God is not always present with us. We read the promise in the 23rd Psalm. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. For you are with me. That's the promise. The promise is that God will always be with us no matter what. Even if we push God away, God's still there. Now God comes in the form of those sent to help. Doctors, nurses, firefighters, police, social workers, clergy, anybody that wants to come and help. I'm always amazed at the number of people willing to put their life on hold and to put their lives on the line to help people in need after a disaster or a tragic event. These are the people that run towards the thing while others are running away. Thank God we have those people. This is the God that comes to bring comfort to others. The fourth promise that we find here at the close of the statement of faith is eternal life. That's the goal, right? Eternal life. This is the culminating promise of God in the statement of faith. Life in the kingdom that has no end. And I'm going to quote Shin again here. The important affirmation here is that the God of creation is the God of our final destiny. The God who gave us life will not desert us in the end. This has been the faith of Christians ever since the first of them told the world that Christ had risen from the dead. He will always be with us. Now, we don't always have a clear picture of what eternal life is. I think if we were to sit around a room uh, together, properly, socially distant, of course, wearing masks, and we would have a discussion about what our image of heaven was, we'd probably all have sort of different uh, beliefs or a different idea, right? We have this idea that comes from the ancient world that heaven is above and the other place is down below and here we are in the middle, right? And we're sort of in the middle behind all of this, right? But we're called to create God's kingdom here on earth by fighting for some things that we've just talked about, justice and mercy and by showing grace. We bring about God's kingdom here by loving everyone and by offering forgiveness. Right, we're back to that idea of love and forgiveness again. The two bookends of everything. Now, I don't believe that heaven is some far off place on a cloud, but right, but that it's right here, just in another dimension separated by a thin veil. Now, the Celts often sp speak of this Thing they call the thin places and those were the places where the distance between the two worlds is very thin and we can almost see it there are some physical places where the Celts believe like the Isle of Iona off the coast of Scotland that that was a very holy place and they felt that the separation between paradise and us was very thin there because it was such it was such a holy place but it's so thin we can almost see it now, I've been to several of these thin places where I've felt the presence of those who have gone before me. And one was this past Sunday at Una's baptism. You all uh, know, I think, that, that my daughter Una was baptized last Sunday. And although both of my parents are gone, I truly felt their presence. And I could feel the warmth and the happiness of their presence that, that were there with us. They're not sitting on some far-off cloud playing the harp. Maybe they're playing Scrabble or watching television or something. But they're not sitting on some far-off cloud playing the harp. They're right here with us. They're right here with me. They're just on the other side of that thin veil. 
Now, if we know the love of God, then we have eternal life, and that cannot be taken away from us. I'm going to leave, I'm going to close out this uh, particular discussion about these promises with a promise, with a quote from uh, Paul's letter to the Romans. And perhaps this passage is one that we can meditate on uh, this week as we move forward and we think about all of these things that we've learned these past weeks and then especially about these promises of God. But it comes from the eighth chapter of Romans, verses 38 and 39. And this is what Paul says. This is the, I'll leave you with this, and this is sort of the final prayer. I'm convinced that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. We come now to that time in our service when we offer our prayers and petitions on behalf of each of us and on behalf of the world. As I mentioned at the start of the service, you may put your prayer requests in the chat on the side of the video or in the comment section on Facebook. But let us pray. God, we thank you for making us daughters and sons, co-heirs with Christ, sisters and brothers of one another, bearing witness with the Spirit, we are the children of God. We pray for the whole church, that in the field of this world, it may be the good seed that grows into your harvest. We pray for your whole creation that is waiting in eager longing to be set free from everything that holds it in bondage. We pray for Earth's people, its nations and leaders, that all may come to know the ways that lead to peace. We pray for those who are ill and for those who are facing death, that they may find hope in the faith that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory to be revealed to them. We pray for those we know and love, that they may see the bond between them and you, and that wherever they go, you are with them. And we pray for those intentions known only in the silence of our hearts. Blessed are you, eternal presence, who with Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit lead us to life everlasting. Amen. And together we pray our prayer of dedication as printed in the bulletin. Loving and ever-present God, receive these tithes and offerings, our worship and our lives to your service. In Jesus' name, amen.
forth, beloved children of God, living in hope and confident in God's promises. May God, our parent, Christ, our brother, and the spirit who gives us breath, bless you and keep you this day and forevermore. Amen. Thank you for watching and have a great week. Thank you.